grateful to have uh, uh, Nilem Tinga. Nilem, come over. And I'll invite uh, Dr. Neda uh, for chair. Then, more importantly, I'm inviting from the International uh, Confederation of Red Cross and Red Crescents, Healthcare in Danger, uh, looking at Anna Baba. And then I'm inviting Flavia from uh, our patient uh, representative from Uganda from Action Group on Health. So, so glad to see you go through the visa hoop <laughs> and finally make it. Uh, good. And Dr. Luis Castello um, will be joining virtually. He's from the Emergency Medicine uh, group and he, uh, European Society of Emergency Medicine and uh, working on the Emergency Medicine Day. But I'll off by introducing everybody so we know. Uh, Dr. Neelam Dingra is uh, the head of the patient flagship, the patient safety flagship, a uh, decade of patient safety 2021-2030 at the World Health Organization. Uh, thanks to Dr. Neelam's great uh, advocacy and work with the ministers and at a very high level um, stakeholders, we managed to get our own World Patient Safety Day. It's managed, marked every 17th September. And this year, we'll urge you to join us and mark it. Uh, orange is that color. We're trying to light up as many monuments in orange as possible. And Dr. Nilam uh, Dinger will be followed by Dr. Neda uh, Kostova, our chair. Uh, Dr. Neda has also the twin honor of being chair of the Patients for Patient Safety Observatory. And she's been helping patients and, uh, um, in research and uh, uh, guidance and plus her own at personal level at the moment. She's uh, within the academia in, um, in the Netherlands. Dr. Luis uh, Castillo is uh, the past president and coach of the EMA uh, Emergency Day Working Group. Uh, and he's been very useful with us uh, over the days, trying to build up guidelines for emergency medicine and looking at what we should be doing. Um, Anna, Anna Baba, I know IRC is uh, the International Red Cross Healthcare in Danger for a long, long time. Uh, we're working closely with them, and there is no un such an unsafe situation <laughs> as when somebody is bombing you. <laughs> You have doctors uh, in the middle of, and you have seen it every day happening in Sudan. You saw what happened, but Syria, but 50 years ago as well, you know, uh, Palestine and other areas. And then Flavia comes from Uganda. Uh, she's executive director of Action Group. Now, it's my double honor here that uh, after doing this MC bit, I need to also moderate this um, session because I. I think this session is really important to me as a patient. I will now ask, uh, uh, before I go on, I say, I just want to remind everybody who's on the, there's about uh, 150 or people now on, online of which you're watching us, uh, that uh, please bear with us. We will go through this program rapidly. I know some of you are almost going to bed, uh, but please uh, stay with us a little bit longer. Thank you. Uh, I'll ask uh, Dr. Neelan. Bring you to come and present. Thank you. Could you say, yes, please. Next slide. So, good afternoon, colleagues. It is such a pleasure to be with you today here. And um, I want to congratulate uh, Ayopo um, under the leadership of Kabul Deep and uh, Dani and all colleagues for firstly congratulations for the 10th patients global conference which is a landmark and a milestone and that shows the commitment and leadership of IOPO and bringing together patients voice in healthcare and I also want to thank them for organizing this event and dedicating a session particularly on the um, building national innovative patients and family partnerships 
to support the Global Patient Safety Action Plan, and which is you know, having safer healthcare in hospitals, primary care, and uh, all health facilities. I have a couple of slides which I would like to show you, and the topic which is given to me is give an overview of the Global Patient Safety Action Plan, what it is, and why it is important for patients, caregivers, and families. So could I have the next slide, please? Um, I just presume that all of you are aware about what is Global Patient Safety Action Plan. This is a culmination of extremely important efforts and initiatives and leadership of many countries which led to a resolution at the World Health Assembly in 2019, and which also established the World Patient Safety Day, as Kavaldeep mentioned, and also um, asked WHO to develop a Global Patient Safety Action Plan, which is aligned with the Sustainable Development Goals, a vision for next 10 years, a roadmap for next 10 years, what needs to be done to improve patient safety globally. So this is what it is, and it was uh, adopted by the World Health Assembly in 2021, so it's two years back. And this World Health Assembly, the 76th World Health, uh, World Health Assembly, we are reporting on the progress in implementation of the action plan for the first time. And we have a mandate to report on the progress in its implementation uh, till 2031. So every two years, we'll be reporting to the World Health Assembly. This is the first report, and we'll have four more reports to, to see the impact of the action which is taken by countries, all stakeholders, to implement and take forward the Global Patient Safety Action Plan. So as you see on your screen, the action plan, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a document which outlines um, the strategic framework, how do we reach uh, uh, zero harm. So it's actually titled Towards uh, um, Eliminating Avoidable Harm. So it's basically zero harm in healthcare. That's what its vision is. And if you see a world in which no one is harmed in healthcare and every patient receives safe and respectful care every time, everywhere. Mission which really uh, emphasizes the importance of patient experience. So drive forward policies, strategies, and actions based on science, patient experience, system design, and partnerships to eliminate all sources of avoidable risk and harm to patients and health workers. And the goal which we have defined in this action plan is to achieve the maximum possible reduction in harm which can be avoided, uh, which is due to unsafe healthcare globally. The action plan has seven strategic objectives, and under each of these strategic objectives, there are five strategies. So it's a well-structured approach, and then there are several uh, indicators to assess the improvement over time. So there are 10 core indicators as well. What you see on your screen are the seven strategic um, objectives, policies for zero patient harm, high reliability systems and organizations, safety of clinical processes, patients' family engagement as a strong pillar, health worker education, skills and safety, information research and risk management, and synergy partnership and solidarity. Even at the risk of repeating, uh, for those who are already aware of it, I think it's important to outline what is the action plan, what does it say, what are the strategies uh, in this action plan. And under each of these strategies, there are actions as well. Could, could I have the next one, please? Next. So this is the strategic uh, framework or framework for action, seven by five metrics. And you can see under these seven strategic objectives, there are five strategies in each one of them. And when you go to the, when you refer to the document, you will see under each of these strategies, there are actions, suggested actions for key stakeholders and key partners. So we've identified some category of, uh, of uh, professionals, uh, organizations, and category of partners in action who need to implement this action plan to move towards zero harm. And I'll, I'll come back to that later. But this is the seven by five metrics which the action plan refers to. Next, please. And there are seven guiding principles as well before we start implementing. Uh, the guiding principles relate, again, very much uh, on engaging patients and families as partners in safe care, achieving results through lab working, analyzing and sharing data to generate learning, translate evidence into actionable and measurement improvement, base policies and action on the nature of care settings, 
use scientific expertise and patient experience to improve safety and instill a safety culture in the design and delivery of healthcare. So this is something which we are all aware, but this very clearly outlines some of these guiding principles for implementation of the action plan. Next slide, please. So next seven slides, I'll just show one slide each on the strategic objective and broadly tell what does it entail, what are the strategies under each of these strategic objectives. The one on policies to eliminate avoidable harm is basically asking policymakers and leaders to make zero avoidable harm to patients a state of mind and a rule of engagement. We are not setting zero as a target, but we are setting that whenever you develop policies, even one harm which occurred, which could be avoided, is too many, too many. So zero avoidable harm is the vision. And when you set the policies and strategies, make that as a mindset that you have to work towards zero. So we address policies, the sources, legislation, safety standards uh, under this uh, strategic objective, and also focusing on some of the special initiatives of WHO on the Global Patient Safety Challenge, which is a challenge which WHO gives to countries, and campaigns like World Patient Safety Day. Next, please. Uh, high reliability systems and organizations to protect patients daily from harm through safety culture, leadership, effective governance, application human rights, and also having very clear directions to handle emergencies and uh, adverse uh, uh, situations. Next, please. So this is where we actually are speaking of at the bedside, the safety of clinical processes. Every time there's interaction between a healthcare worker and a patient in a health facility. Uh, we have to identify risk-prone procedures, what can cause harm, uh, the, the safety of medical devices, medicines, blood, and vaccines. Not only the product safety, but also when you use these products, how do we ensure safety? Special programs, which I mentioned earlier, the Global Patient Safety Challenge, particularly focusing on medication safety and also infection prevention control. The safety in primary care and transitions of care, and also uh, safety in mental health settings. Next, next slide, please. Number four, which is the meaningful patient family engagement being the strongest pillar for this action plan, to engage and empower patients and families and caregivers to help and support the journey to safer healthcare. And this relates to developing programs, promoting communication strategies for information and education of patients and families, uh, learning from patient experience, uh, in conducting research and studies, how do we learn from patient experience, and also co-develop policies and programs, build capacity of advocates and champions, and also develop some sort of ecosystem policies, safety culture and structures for uh, incident disclosure. Next, please. Number five, health worker education, skills, and safety, that we inspire, educate, skill, and protect health workers to contribute to the design and del delivery of safe care systems through firstly identifying centers of excellence, providing them education and training through structured curricula, uh, identifying patient safety competencies, and making sure that these are part of uh, um, patient safety competencies are part of the curriculum which is being developed for education of medical and, uh, and all other multi-professionals. Also linking patient safety competencies with appraisal systems of health workers and providing a safe working environment. Next, please. Number six relates to information research and risk management, in particular, reporting and learning systems. So ensure a constant flow of information and knowledge to drive the mitigation of risk, reduction in the levels of avoidable harm, and also lead to improvements in safety of care through incident reporting and learning systems, you know, reporting on errors, on near misses, and also uh, incidents of harm and then patient safety surveillance, uh, research in patient safety, particularly how do we engage uh, patients and how we, they contribute to safety, and ap application of digital solutions and technology as well. And finally, the next one, please. And that is how do we develop synergies and partnerships and solidarity, uh, developing a sustainable and sustained multi-sectoral, multinational strategy, so synergy, partnership, and solidarity to improve patient safety and quality of care through common understanding with partners, stakeholders, engagement, patient works, specific networks for patients as well, those who have been harmed in healthcare, patients and families. And WHO has a special initiative on patients for patient safety. 
Uh, so network creation, multi-sectoral initiatives aligned with other technical programs like primary health care, universal health coverage, quality of care, health workforce. So looking into these linkages so that patient safety is embedded in every clinical health and safety program. Next, please. So uh, just an overview of what we do, and these are like six streams of work which I have listed here. This is a flagship initiative of WHO, a decade of patient safety, which I'm heading at WHO headquarters. And this is a WHO's response to the global call for action on patient safety. Um, the key streams of work you see on the screen are, of course, taking forward World Patient Safety Day and maximizing its impact through developing a campaign, developing several uh, te technical products, and also rolling out several initiatives and, and working with countries and partners to take it forward. Um, working with countries and partners to implement the Global Patient Safety Action Plan, take forward the strategic approach to implementing medication without harm, which is a, a global patient safety challenge. Also have global patient safety collaborative mechanisms and networks and patient safety standards and guidelines and tools. There are several of them we keep we have, are developing in patient safety. What I show you here is what we released last year is implications of COVID-19 pandemic uh, for patient safety. Uh, and also, uh, very importantly, and the strongest pillar, patient and family engagement, which I think uh, um, engaging patients and families is so vital. And I think it's a truly an untapped potential of improving safety in healthcare. Next, please. So I briefly mentioned the partners in action, which the action plan identifies. And under each of these partners, their, um, their actions recommended what the, these key partners can do to implement the action plan. And these are suggestive and recommended actions, but not really set in stone. And every country, every institution, every facility has to adapt and adopt it the way uh, they would like, they, they is feasible. So governments, government institutions, policymakers, regulators, uh, different ins institutes are working on patient safety. Several countries have developed national patient safety centers as well, and I can name a two, Saudi Patient Safety Center and Institute for Patient Safety and Quality in Singapore. And there are several countries who are now developing these institutions. Either they are just uh, assigning responsibility to existing institutions, or they are actually creating institutes who take responsibility for implementing action on patient safety. Uh, different stakeholders, all category of stakeholders, patient organizations, civil society organizations, academic and research institutions, professional bodies, industry. Uh, so that's the second category of partners. And then uh, at, the, at the bedside and point of care is healthcare facilities and services and the leaders in healthcare facilities and services. And finally, WHO Secretariat through different levels uh, of, of WHO through country offices, regional offices, and the global headquarters. Next, please. Just couple of to share with you. So as I mentioned that this is the first time we are reporting to the World Health Assembly on the action plan towards eliminating avoidable harm in healthcare. And this is the uh, report which is now available on website. If you just search uh, for this interim report, and there is a report to the assembly. There are 10 key action points which we have reported to the assembly on what has been uh, the progress in the last two years. And then there is a link to this report also. So it's a short report about 15 pages, but gives an overview of where we are on patient safety globally. Next, please. I just want to share that these are the uh, 10 core indicators on which we have created a baseline. Uh, and so if the first one is on uh, national uh, patient safety action plan in equivalent, 27 per percent countries have developed uh, national action plans on patient safety. Uh, if we go in that order, 36% countries have implemented a system for reporting never events or sentinel events. 31% countries have established national targets for reducing healthcare associated infections. 18% countries have established targets at national level for reducing medication related harm. So these two, 30, uh, the, on medication related harm and, and healthcare associated infections, where we are trying to measure the outcome as well, that whether there's improvement over years, all the others are more process uh, indicators. And, and then you can see 13% um, countries have a patient representative on the governing boards of, um, on, in 60% of, of hospitals. So this is really the baseline we have. And we have a long way to go. And, and the, everyone in this room, and particularly IOPO leading this initiative, is absolutely vital to see this improvement year after year 
that how many more countries are taking it forward. So this is an indicator which is uh, part of the core indicators. Um, and 20% uh, countries have uh, incorporated patient safety curriculum in education programs uh, in healthcare professionals. And then uh, we have a health worker safety charter. Only 18% countries have so far signed for it. 31% uh, countries have um, that have 60% or more healthcare facilities which participate in reporting a learning system. And then 18% countries publish an annual report on patient safety, which is a mark of public accountability that you're transparently sharing uh, um, annually what's, where the, the country's patient safety situation is. And finally, um, we have only 22% countries which have established national patient safety network. So you can see, and we actually got response, if you see in the small print here, we have 102 countries who responded. There's almost the same number of countries, what we see the percentage. Uh, we are actually working on a, a um, comprehensive global patient safety report as well, which would we'll be launching um, towards the end of this year, which will have very detailed analysis of the data which we have received from countries. Um, I think just have one or more slide. Next slide, please. So this is the particular indicator, which is a, a percentage of countries that have a patient representative on governing boards in majority of the hospitals, which is more than 60%. And you can see in the spectrum of uh, income groups of the World Bank, high income countries, upper middle, lower middle, and low income countries, you will see that each and every category of countries is a long way to go. So 26% countries, for example, say they are fully met that they, more than 60% hospitals have a patient representative, but even in high income country. So it is not really affected by the income status. It's basically how you develop your system. Even in uh, low income and low middle income countries, such systems have been established. Mm -hmm. However, we have a long way to go across the world in establishing uh, you know, formal mechanisms of patient engagement in healthcare. Mm -hmm. Next, please. So uh, just the last word about World Patient Safety Day. We've had four successful World Patient Safety Days so far. Uh, on the first one on speaker for patient safety, the second one in 2020 on speaker for health worker safety. As you know, it was established in 2019, so that was the first one. Then second one was in 2020 on health worker safety. 21 was, um, 2021 was on focus on safe metal and newborn care. And then last year we had medication without harm. Uh, as the call for action on medication safety. And this year, engaging patients for patient safety is our uh, theme for, uh, for World Patient Safety Day with the slogan, elevate the voice of patients in healthcare. So uh, with that, uh, just the next one, please. So I want to conclude by um, sharing with you this QR code. We, in this preparation for the World Patient Safety Day of this year, we are uh, developing several communications and technical products and also organizing events. So there will be an in-person event in WHO headquarters uh, 11 to 13th of September, and it will be also online. So those of you who are interested in uh, participating, please let us know. Uh, and also, um, we are developing an initiative on patient stories. So uh, developing a storytelling toolkit, as well as uh, collating stories and collecting um, new stories from patients so that we can have some actionable uh, points coming from these uh, stories. So this is an initiative on patient stories and experience for safer care. And I would like to invite all participants and membership of IOPO, if you can circulate this to your membership, so that uh, this has a link uh, to a data call form where you can uh, provide the input on whether you or you know anyone who would like to share um, how they were affected, whether it's a safe care or unsafe care, how they were, how they experienced healthcare, and how to improve the safety of healthcare. So this is one of the mechanism to elevate the voice of patients and learn from patient experience. So with those words, I would like to thank you very much for your attention and thank you, IOPO leadership, for giving this opportunity to WHO and to me to, to join today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much, Mila. Um, our work is cut out. I think Neelam's put the figures on the hat. Please access that report. Um, you saw the figure 13% of us uh, in some hospital ward or, or on a board. But almost 90% of us in the wards, you know. <laughs> so we seem to be in the wrong place. 
Oh, we like to see more on the management. Of them. Uh, just to give you an indication, one of our um, initiatives in my hospital in Twickenham, um, in order to make um, management more accessible, uh, they put uh, like lines when you enter into the hospital. So you've got red line going to say the kidney care, blue to the cancer, so that patients can follow that. Uh, they've cleverly placed a dotted line this year, which goes straight to the, w the, the executive director of the hospital's <laughs> office. <laughs> so people know where it is. You know where to go to complain. You know. He's not hidden somewhere. So yes, uh, that would be very important. And secondly, I think the voices. Yeah, Please, we do need uh, cases. I think all of you know of uh, patient harm case, and you know somebody interesting how they can tell the story. You know the people who can some. So I was laughing with Neelam yesterday. He was going on to telling story. I said, you know what? We could open a floodgate because some of our people, they like talking. They'll keep on talking. They'll t keep on talking the story. So you'll have to find somebody who's really good at dig uh, editing this. But yes, but do help us out. And everybody who's listening in, I think, uh, online, uh, please do start spreading the word and let's make sure we have a very successful uh, family and patient engagement as we go forward. Without much ado, uh, I'm putting the pressure on <laughs> our chair. Uh, I wouldn't ask uh, the chair on any of the plan, but what I would like to ask her to do is give us um, how can patients and expert patients families and carers engage in the GP uh, Global Patient Safety Action Plan and Patient Safety Day. Uh, Neda. Thank you so much, Kaladeep. Um, I don't think you will be putting any pressure on me. I think the whole job was already done by Neelam. Thank you so much for being here. And I'm not saying for telling us about the Global Patient Safety Action Plan. What I mean is by putting all your efforts and your whole team to work towards it. We all know how difficult it was. Patient safety is not new, doesn't start from the Global Action Plan. But what is novel there is that we are first time recognized that we can be there as a specific strategic objective. Many documents have us somewhere in a small footnote. Um, that is the one thing that it, uh, the pioneering work uh, showing in this action plan. And the second thing is that they really made 193 countries sign up to the commitments that are listed there and to the indicators. Yeah, we are very low still, but we can walk together. And we really can see that you walk the talk with us, not only by the toolkit that you mentioned, and thank you very much also for inviting us all to, to participate in the, uh, in the storytelling toolkit, in the sharing of the stories, and also in the consultation we had last December. So you are really trying to, to, to involve us. And please, it is us as patients that also have to contribute to that. So if we are given a space, we should use it. We should try to provide our stories. Of course, not only stories, solutions, ideas. And what I will be talking about today, if we can have the next slide, is actually how we as patients and families and caregivers can um, include ourselves, can involve ourselves in uh, helping the implementation of the uh, zero harm, uh, zero avoidable harm. If we can have the next slide, please. So this was already, um, uh, the, the background of the slide was already shared by Neelam. So I will be talking a little bit, zooming into the strategic objective four, which is about patient and family engagement. And these five, um, it has five areas of action um, that are actually leading all towards the goal of zero harm. I will not read them uh, one by one. It's too small. I just wanted to say, to, to illustrate with this slide that they are not randomly put there. They're really meaningfully leading to, to a one goal. If we can have the next slide then, and um, I will be trying to take you through these five, but not again, as Neelam was saying, in a prescriptive way. If we can have the next slide, please. I think our um, slide is somewhere in India, and for them it's really very late, and I think they're staying up with us to put the slides on. Um, 
So, as I mentioned, these five um, areas of action, and as Neela mentioned, they are not prescriptive of what we need to do. They are just examples. But they are very good examples, and I will try to link these examples to what Rose was saying in the previous um, uh, session. So, um, if we can have the next slide. So, these um, are, again, as Rose mentioned, we have two levels of engagement of patients. One is engagement A, uh, participation A, and participation B. So, in the plan, you can see there are different stakeholders. If we can have the next slide. Not quite, but uh, that's okay. Um, so you can see, actually you could have seen, uh, below there is a, a one more box. There are three categories of actions that are given for any of the strategic objectives. But for our objective, it is important to understand where we as patients or caregivers can in get ourselves involved or can um, look carefully of processes going on in our um, uh, governments, in our ministries, and uh, try to involve ourselves into those or try to imply ourselves into those processes if we are not invited. So try to follow what is happening, not only what we can do ourselves, but how we can help those processes or how we can influence them. So there are three categories of actions. One is the governments, and they were mentioned by Neelam, but for us in our strategic objective, governments, uh, healthcare providers, and um, other health stakeholders, and then other stakeholders involving civil society and patient organizations. Now for the third one, we come later, it's quite easy. They give us an idea what we can do, we can empower our membership, but it is important also to involve in the other two. And this is the participation B that Rose was mentioning, actually uh, how we can influence the policy level, how we can influence or inform um, uh, the, the uh, uh, policy processes or the health systems, improve the health systems. But also, as we uh, talked earlier, participation A informs participation B. So if we can have the next slide. So then it means that when we have um, the third uh, tire or the actions, I'm very sorry that you cannot see the, the, the title. This was supposed to be popping up, but it doesn't. Um, and that is what a um, mistake in a system does. You know, if you have one faulty thing in the system, then it becomes a safety issue, doesn't it? For patients, it might cost a life. So for us, it's, it's okay, we can still read. Um, so just coming back to the third um, uh, group of uh, stakeholders, which involves uh, uh, civil society and patient organizations, through those actions, and we can, uh, see here, ensure professional associations invite patients and organize workshops, uh, share experiences. So those are the, the points in the action plan where we can actually uh, use the participation A. Every time actions described at the level of uh, civil society, this is where we can share our uh, participation A. And just for Neelam, because you were not here, participation A means um, uh, Unbi maybe biased, unbiased, but personal experience sharing. Participation B is using the personal experience sharing for improving the system. So sort of making it um, more in a structured way, actionable, but also objective. Because personal accounts can be sometimes not, um, it's not invalid, but it sometimes can be too subjective. So making participation A um, transforming it into something that can be universally applicable across systems. So these are the couple of um, uh, messages I just wanted to, to share with you. Of course, I will not go through the actions. As Neelam was saying, these are not prescriptive, and this is not something to, to read out loud now. You can go back with that idea that actually um, we can involve on two levels. One is individual with our involvement. The other one is on a system level, and every specific box offers um, activities that w where we can um, in involve ourselves. If we can have the next slide, and maybe then the next, because um, um, I think it's more or less gives the same message. Can we have the next slide then? Yeah, so the, the action areas four and five, they're more really 
about patient A, uh, but how do we get to a meaningful participation A? So we also need to work on the asymmetry of information. We also need to work on the health literacy. We need to uh, inform and educate the patients how to meaningfully share their experience without stripping it off the emotion, but rather how to make it more contextualized and provide um, more meaning or more value for improving the system. So these are the, the, the actions, for example, what we can do. We can raise awareness of what is happening. We can raise awareness of collecting the stories as Neelam just did a minute ago. Please go and fill in that uh, patient story um, uh, form. Um, we can raise awareness also about the positive purpose of the open disclosure report because if the patients involved in that kind of uh, action, they can really, I wouldn't say normalize, it's not, a, a, it has a kind of negative connotation, but try to openly speak about mistakes whereby we can really reach to the zero avoidable harm. If we hide them, we will never get there. And if we get to the uh, 4.5 uh, area of action in the next slide, please. And that one is uh, more about um, information and education. And again, coming to the health literacy uh, that we talked about in the previous uh, session. So one example is uh, use a peer education for patients and families, support patients in managing, um, and so on and so forth. But um, so we have all the prerequisites in the plan laid out by your team um, endorsed by the countries, commit, countries committing to do something like this, to, to implement the plan. They've set up the indicators, so we need to monitor, but we also need to take action. So taking these actions are really um, some example, but then also educating the patients on how they can take, or educating our members, educating other organizations that are not members on how they can do that. So if we go to the next slide, you can see that we already developed um, IPO and the observatory. We already, next slide please. We already developed a course taking you through, so it's a patient safety understanding the global patient safety action plan. So we have done module by module for each of the strategic objectives, um, specifically how the patients can, so elaborating what the patient organizations, families, caregivers can do, patient advocates as well and then also giving examples what some countries have done or what some uh, patient organizations have done. So have a look at that. You can also use the QR code to access it. Um, you might need to register, but that's uh, uh, still okay. It's not a very long course, four to six hours if you take it straight ahead. If not, you can digest it slowly. There are some resources, of course. There are many resources from the WHO website, from other uh, uh, places. You can also send us um, uh, information on other useful resources you would like us to put there. And um, please join if you would like to help everyone, help your country, help your patients, help uh, IABO, help um, to um, really achieve the zero harm. And one last thing I just want to, maybe we go to the next slide. Um, so thank you for uh, your attention, but also I would like to once again just stress that I don't think it was um, in, um, unintentional. I don't think, I think it was quite symbolic that actually the strategic objective four is right in the middle. So it means the patients are really at the center. Please let's uh, put together the forces to make zero harm, zero avoidable harm possible. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Neda. Uh, now to Do Dr. Luis Castillo, who's waiting online uh, to join us. Um, I've been working with uh, the European uh, Emergency Medicine um, group for some time now and uh, we've been looking at certain things. Uh, we have got the European Medicines uh, Day coming up uh, soon. Uh, Dr. Castillo will share with us some data uh, surveys they found out. Um, when Neelam was describing uh, in very uh, good terms that uh, there are some situations which are extremely dangerous in themselves and in, when medication happens in that, uh, then the danger is uh, quadrupled, you know. Uh, you're in a rush, you don't know. 
people are shouting when there's uh, someone bleeding away or something's happening, and patient harm happens there. So it's very important to share this idea of how you're working in emergency medicine because that's where it's all happening at one time or other. So Dr. Luis Kesulu, could you come in? Um. Thank you. I hope you can hear me. You can hear me? Ah, yes, we can. Okay. Perfect, thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon to, to everybody and uh, thanks for inviting me to this uh, great meeting that provides us, uh, the professional from my organization, to get in closer contact with patients, family and patients organizations. Uh, the idea, as uh, the moderator has uh, said, is to report about a survey that we recently have done at, uh, based on patients visiting the emergency departments. But uh, before uh, I do this, I would like to provide you with some clues that you can um, make you understand better the, the results. So I am the past president of the European Society of Emergency Medicine. This organization represents uh, physicians, nurses and paramedics from 38 European countries. We work as a federation, as an individual organization. And we have uh, an activity that is the Emergency Medicine Day, celebrated the 27th of, of May, that uh, annually uh, has a, a motto that uh, uh, put uh, closer our activities to other physicians and also to patients, families and stakeholders uh, to try to improve the activities that we do in our system. So please, can you move to the next slide? Every year we have a, a special motto for this day, for the Medicine Medicine Day. It started five uh, years ago. At the beginning, during the first two years, our main interest was to improve the, the education, the training of the, of the professionals. So we really focus on the specialty of emergency medicine. And during the last uh, two years, the past year, our motto was uh, regarding team morale due to the situation that we were aware that uh, our professionals are suffering after the COVID pandemic that so badly has hidden our services. And this year we were uh, focusing on patient safety. That is the reason why we are linked to this uh, meeting today. So uh, can you move to the next one? Uh, next slide, please. Thanks. So uh, during the past two years, we have tried to base our activity of the Medicine Medicine Day uh, in some uh, reports, in some data, in some scientific uh, base. So last year, we did a survey through our professionals regarding the situation of the team morale to try to identify the burnout level and the reasons for the burnout. Uh, after that, uh, usually we, we provide a, a position statement trying to correct the situation. This year, as I have told you, safety of the patients is our um, motto, our life mo motif. And we did it the same. We, we uh, launched three surveys, one to professionals that has been already finalized and is going to re be reported the results uh, in our journal the same 27th of May. Another one for patients that I am going to provide you with the first results, our provisional results, but I think it will uh, uh, illustrate what is the, the feeling of, of the patients visiting the dementia department. And another survey for patients' organizations, just to catch the, the, the feeling, the perception that they have regarding this, this problem. So let us move to the next one. Next one, please. Uh, the European Society of Emergency Medicine, our organization, uh, follows the, the concept of emergency medicine uh, that uh, uh, the WHO has launched some, some years ago. So we have the concept that uh, emergency medicine practice is a system that starts when the patient gets in contact with the emergency medical uh, services, uh, usually through dispatch centers. Uh, it includes the, the uh, care provided on a scene also the, tr the medical transport to the hospitals, to the emergency departments, the care in the emergency department since the patient is discharged home or admitted to the war in the hospital. It is important to have the, the idea in mind that one third of the population of the European countries 
go through the emergency department as patients annually. That is a huge uh, figure, a huge number. So this part of the healthcare is really irrelevant. Uh, we don't admit all the patients to the to the to the hospital. Only in between ten or thirty percent of the visits are admitted. But uh, for the hospital, our activity is important because in between forty and eighty percent of the patients admitted to hospitals they go through the emergency department. So the activity that the, we do is uh, relevant, and also because uh, it is the access to the health system in many occasions, mainly in the urgent cases. So let us now go to the results of the survey. Can we move to the next slide, please? Well, the survey was distributed at the beginning of this year. So uh, the, the forms were sent in, during January and February, and they were distributed to scientific uh, medical societies and also patients organizations, as you have uh, been hearing in this, in this meeting. It's orientated. This, this survey is oriented to patients and families. Uh, we have received responses, actually, because the survey is not yet closed, we have received 450 responses from 57 different countries. There are four domains that are evaluated in the survey. Uh, the safety perceptions of the uh, patient visiting the emergency department. Uh, reasons for avoiding the emergency department. We know that the, they are fear from uh, part of the population to go through the emergency department for different reasons and that causes uh, important delays in, in care and also really damage on the, on the, on the patients. Uh, we uh, also uh, evaluate and, and explore the perception that the visitors to the emergency department have about the professional's compliance and about the system performance that we think is a very important aspect of this uh, problem. As you can see in the, in the two graphs, uh, only of the 11% of, of the respondents didn't went or didn't pass through the emergency department during the last year. This is uh, in concordance with the figures that I have presented in the previous slide. And we have a good balance in between uh, patients and families or, or you know, people caring for, for the patients that visit the, the emergency department. 60% they were patients, 40% they were uh, families. So let us go to the real results. Next slide, please. The first slide represents uh, the perception of those visiting the, the emergency department, how they, they feel. Uh, and as, as you can see in the bottom of the, of the uh, bars on the graph, uh, most of them, they feel safe. Let us say that 80% they feel safe. On safety is a perception that some of them have, but it's not really a big number. But in the opposite uh, part of the graph, in the top of the graph, we can see that they don't feel comfortable or they don't, don't feel protected and they don't feel listened. So these are important aspects that uh, we have learned from this, from this uh, survey that we have to take care of. Let us move to the next one. What are the fears that the uh, patients uh, have when they visit the, the, the Mercy uh, Department? Uh, the, the more problematic ones are in the top of the graph. So the biggest fear is to have uh, admission delays or also uh, and delays in the diagnosis. So delays are, are an important aspect. And we know that uh, probably we are not doing very well in this aspect. We know the overcrowding situation and the delays in uh, admission to the wars uh, uh, are important aspects that uh, uh, are, are uh, really uh, complicating the care that we are providing in the emergency department. Uh, we also know that the, they have fears of having infections uh, when they visit the emergency department. And this is a reason why during the COVID some delays or also avoiding the, the uh, using uh, uh, the, the emergency medical services has caused some, some problems. But if, if you take a look to the to the bottom of the of the graph, you see that the uh, uh, medical errors or medication errors are not considered a very important aspect uh, by this by these uh, responders of the of the survey and also they don't have uh, the perception that falls that is also an important problem that uh, uh, we are taking care of uh, are uh, problems in the in the or are risks for them in the emergency department and let us move to the next one that 
the regarding data is going to be the last one. Uh, what is the perception about the staff? How they feel that the, the staff, including uh, nurses uh, and doctors and also other ancillary professionals that are working in the emergency department, um, how they perceive uh, the, the professionalism? Uh, well, the perception is not bad, as you can see in the in the bottom of the, of the graph. Uh, they think that they are professional and kind, most of them. Uh, they don't feel that they are rude, but you can say that they're angry. They start perceiving that some of them, they are angry. Why they are angry? They are angry because the next perception is because they, they are overwhelmed and uh, they are not uh, enough. There are few professionals uh, in if you compare with the, uh, with the demand. So this is the last uh, slide that I have regarding this provisional uh, data. Uh, I have to tell you that uh, uh, I have learned a, a lot. My colleagues uh, have also, my colleagues has also uh, very pleased with this information because uh, they allowed us to focus in those aspects that uh, uh, are more relevant for the for the patients. And uh, uh, I would like to to invite you to to visit our web page uh, regarding this activity this year. It's focused, as I told you, on safety, the Emergency Medicine Day celebration. Uh, you can uh, type in Google Emergency Medicine Day and you will go directly to the to the web page. It is focused uh, also uh, for patients and, and, and families. It's also orientated to collect information as uh, we have here from the previous present, uh, for the, for the previous uh, presentations, how important it is to, to have uh, direct information from, from the users of, of the systems to try to improve them. Thank you for your attention and excuse me for not being uh, directly uh, doing this presentation with you there. I will be more than pleased to answer your questions during the discussion. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Luis Castillo. That, that was well presented, I think. And it, it inspired us a lot. You know, it was one of those situations where the patient can do absolutely nothing now that he or she is in the hands of the experts uh, and the family is. And that's a very worrying time. My next speaker we, we comes from our very close cooperation with the International Commit Committee of uh, the Red Cross and the Red Crescent over the hill. In days gone by before we had um, the pandemic, the building used to be open to us uh, non-state actors and we really loved it, you know, the terrace and that. And their generosity was really helpful. We were given full access to the building. We don't forget your work and we always appreciate it. So health, Healthcare in Danger was a project we were working with and uh, there is a massive situation that if you thought an accident emergency was a high risk situation, you can now imagine a whole region uh, in war, masses of patients moving, diabetics now don't have a supply chain of insulin, uh, they're wounded, uh, there are other issues. At the same time, violence upon health workers as well, very important. So we would now ask um, Dr. Anna Baba to uh, speak up for healthcare in danger and enthusiasts uh, enthusiasm to join them and help us in the future. Dr. Anna Baba. Hi everyone, it's really a big pleasure for me to be here and uh, be listening to, to the other speakers also. I think I'm learning a lot. Um, so I'm trying, I'm go, what I'm going to try to do here with you is basically cover a lot of ground in a very short time. So bear with me if I go too fast because the idea is really to make a link between what we're discussing here, uh, patient safety basically, and the reality of violence that we see in different ways and in different environments. So if we can go to the first slide, the next one, please. I just wanted to frame very quickly, so where am I coming from or talking about? I work for the International Committee of the Red Cross, as Dr. Simi was saying, and typically we come to conferences and we, we talk to people bringing in this humanitarian approach. It's here, we'll, we'll cover that, but I don't want to talk just about that. Uh, of course, when we are delivering uh, healthcare or supporting the delivery, uh, the delivery of healthcare by other partners in the areas where we work in war, uh, and uh, other situations of violence, we find that there are several challenges to be able to deliver. 
when we want to start or scale up a specific response. And I guess you can imagine what types of challenge would be. For example, often we don't have enough supplies or we don't have the right type of supplies available at the site. We don't have the right HR to deliver or scale up uh, uh, an emergency response. We have a problem of logistics in general to circulate areas where uh, violence is on. We also challenges to, to continue if care. So for that were already in some lines of care in that area, we need to continue that. We cannot just shift everything towards the emergency. So then that is another type of challenge because then uh, whatever the person was already receiving as healthcare might be broken because of the same reasons that I just mentioned, but also because, for example, the people might be displaced from the, the area where they're normally receiving care or they normally um, uh, circulate to, to, to receive the care. And then finally, the, the third category of challenges we find is exactly how to handle this environment. Because typically we think of a very, very hostile environment. So I thank Dr. Semi for saying, well, the bombs are falling. Well, thankfully, not that often bombs are effectively falling, uh, but there is a very hostile environment to, to, to the delivery of healthcare. And, and that is, for example, a high circulation of weapons, a high circulation of security agents. It can be from the military, police and all. Um, it can be uh, challenges in, in, in uh, getting to and coming back from, from health facilities. So this is the typical environment and that brings a very specific frame to the delivery of healthcare. And this is what I'm So in the next slide, I brought in some questions related exactly to this context, to this environment where healthcare is being provided. And then, yes, exactly. Can you just go down with the questions? Yes, thank you. So these are some key questions that we have to ask ourselves when we're trying to deliver healthcare in these environments. And um, my, my point here to you is that maybe some of these questions are a bit obvious, but they're often not asked. So this is the first element that we have to take into consideration. So we're not, we're not too often asking what is the physical condition of that place of care? What is going on outside of that place of care? So if I step out of that healthcare facility, what is going on outside? Is it safe to do this displacement to move from my house to the healthcare facility and back? Uh, is it safe to remain at that site if something happens? And is there a trustful relationship between health personnel and the patients? And um, so the, the second sad element of what I'm showing here is that w even when these questions are asked, normally they're asked to the health workers and not to the patients and not to the families either. So you see, there could be an angle of, of answers that could be brought by the health workers that would be very helpful already to understand the context and the environment, but then we would be necessarily missing a very, very important element that is the experience of the patient and how the patient is actually being localized in that, in that context and that environment. Uh, so with that, then in the next slide, we, I would like to, to, to move into then the very specifics of why should we discuss the elements of violence uh, and security when we're talking about uh, patient safety and preventing and trying to prevent avoidable harm. So um, I put here a cycle, it's a very simplified cycle. I would please refer to, to the presentations uh, that we've just done by Dr. Nila Vaineda to, to understand more of what's in that cycle. But the fact is that often uh, we would look at violence as being kind of an environmental element. So I put that red uh, frame around it because people would think, okay, if I'm looking at the processes to implement uh, safe, a safer care, uh, Violence is something that is surrounding that, right? It's somewhere there in the elements that might enable or facilitate uh, a process that I'm trying to implement. But what I'm, I'm, I'm provoking here, the, the, the reflection, is to move towards uh, looking at violence and the occurrence of violence as also being an, immediately, uh, an immediate consequence or an immediately disruptive element to the very process of patient safety that you're trying to implement. So, for example, if we think about what we have uh, uh, in data about violence in different, uh, in different uh, areas of the world, but then I'm focusing, of course, on what we do um, in, in the countries affected by war, 
most of the violence that we see occurring in healthcare facilities relates to quality of care, to insatisfaction, to frustrations by families, and for example, the high circulation of weapons in those places. So you instrumentalize a, a, a weapon that is circulating uh, to solve a problem inside the, the, the hospital setting. And uh, so it's directly connected. And then if we move to the next slide, Thank you. Then we would be looking also at these different layers of violence. And, and, and then here again, I'm bringing the, the, the elements of dissatisfaction, lack of, lack of trust, elements of uh, cultural and communication gaps that are also very much related on uh, what we need to discuss if we want to bring in the patient's perspective to anything that is being done inside a healthcare facility. And then, of course, there might be elements that are more particular to certain, certain contexts, like the free circulation of weapons, criminal acts directly, or the intentional targeting of, of healthcare facilities. Of course, I'm not here advocating that uh, patients or families or the health systems themselves should be bearing all the burden of, uh, of uh, solving the problem of violence. It's not a problem of the healthcare sector alone, but because the consequences fall upon the provision of healthcare, they fall upon health outcomes, they fall upon quality of life, uh, and care. So I think this is a conversation that we need to bring in and then we would think about different strategies according to the context and the needs to respond uh, to the challenges that we're seeing. Could we move to the next slide, please? So in terms of what can be done, because this was another very interesting ask that I received by coming here. So I'm, I'm thinking here of things that can be done by patients and by families. I'm not, I'm not just putting forward the perspective of uh, the, the healthcare system directly, but uh, so of course we can work hard to push on those elements of qualities of care, but bringing also the discussion to highest achievable standards, because often in the context where the ICRC is working, people tend to let go of certain standards because they think that it's just not possible. There's a war ongoing outside, so it's not possible. But yes, it is possible. We have to discuss what is the highest threshold possible and then maintaining that and then elevating as we can. So always pushing for that including, of course, the communities and the patients in the decisions about pathways of care, the placement of the facilities themselves, the functioning of the services. Um, and here I'm also um, bringing some very anecdotal uh, elements, but for example, um, often healthcare services decide without asking patients what is the best time to open the service to, to function. And that is not often compatible to what the, the, the communities actually need or can do and especially in insecure areas where sometimes you actually need to take extra care to, to go and move around. Uh, of course, ensure compliance to medical ethics and uh, uh, put pressure on the health systems to develop communication and intercultural skills in health workers. So I think this, this is an important ask that has to come from the communities. It has to come from the patients and the families to say, I don't think that the health workers are prepared to handle certain intercultural differences, for example. Um, of course, advocate widely and constantly against attacks and uh, I guess the the partnership that Dr. Kusemi was just mentioning that we have with the IPO is long-standing and it's exactly in that, uh, in that, going that direction. Uh, but then there are some more structural elements to what can be done. For example, encourage steering and promoting legislation and policy frameworks that are more protective of healthcare that ensure, for example, that patients who have been victim of violence inside a healthcare facility, they are compensated for that, for example, and other elements and, uh, if possible, enforce structure of health facilities uh, in areas that are most vulnerable. So these are just some elements. Of course, this is not exhaustive. But then the, the very last slide, then with some, with some key messages, the next one, please. So um, this conversation of bringing violence into the picture is not really a conversation to talk just about fears. And it's also not a conversation about making peace. I'm not here trying to say that we all have to be peace advocates to make sure that this is considered. 
it's really about ethics, it's about trust, it's about satisfaction, well-being, respect. Uh, it's elements that thankfully I'm listening a lot today here. Uh, uh, the, the other panel, also the previous panel, was also talking about trust building a lot. But this is really the, the bridges that need to be done so that violence can be prevented and mitigated when it's happening. And of course, uh, we know that healthcare should be free from violence regardless of the context. There's no excuse, no excuse to accept violence in any context in war or in other uh, situations. Um, so including violence is a missing element. So elements are still uh, missing. So here my, my ask to you back is that uh, you not only include that when you think about Sudan or you think about Syria or you think about uh, Afghanistan, but also when you think about Spain, as we just heard from, from Dr. Uh, Luis, when we talk about uh, the Netherlands, when we talk about Canada or we talk about Peru, it doesn't matter. A, a violence should always be taken into consideration. And of course, the violence from the perspective or the, the experience of and fears uh, from the perspective of, of patients and communities, not just from healthcare workers, because it's, it's massive. The literature only sees violence happening in healthcare facilities from the perspective of healthcare workers. There are very, very few, but very few really that talk about the experience of the patients. And uh, of course, uh, talking about safety without security is a bit of an incomplete puzzle. Mm -hmm. And I, I thank WHO also for having mentioned that in the framework. So back in the development of, of the framework, the, the element of security is included as one of the, the contextual elements that has to be considered. So I think that's it from my side. I'll be glad to, to discuss further, but uh, I will encourage you in the, the very, can you put, yeah, to visit our website if you ever want to to learn more about it, we have a dedicated website. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. I think it was very nice of you to introduce the topic of violence as uh, even under normal state of affairs. Our next speaker um, is going to be Flavia. Uh, I think Flavia comes from the Great Lake, Great Lake area from Uganda. And the Great Lakes area has seen some tremendous uh, violence and disruption of healthcare on their border uh, to the south uh, sits Rwanda. And Rwanda went through that huge um, conflict, you know, the genocide and destabilized it. And uh, I've got uh, one of our assistants there, Bernadette is from Rwanda as well, and you can talk to her, she'll explain what happened. And on the other side, of the northern side of the borders is uh, South Sudan and Sudan, and they joined up. And you, in Uganda itself, I think Flavia will remember the national uh, memories of uh, the dictator Idi Amin. Uh, and that's where my family <laughs> intersects with them because uh, part of my family was in Uganda and part in Kenya. So we saw the, that also happening. So Flavia is in a good position not only to talk about uh, violence in healthcare, but also at a personal level, you know, what uh, we were told at the hospital level. What, where is that violence being committed in day-to-day -day version, when your autonomy is not respected, when you're not in control? Flavia, over to you now. Good evening, good afternoon, good morning for those online. I'm Flavia Chomkama from Uganda, like we have talked about. I work for an, ad, an agency called Action Group for Health, Human Rights and, HI, and HIV AIDS, AGA. But I also lead the Women at 40 campaign. It's a campaign of networks of women living with HIV. And why Women at 40 is that we have had HIV for the last 40 years in our country. And so what has been our contribution? So I am from a patient's organization. I'm a patient advocate. The organization is equally patient advocate, but I'm also a patient. I live with HIV since, since 1994. And I also have had uh, recent surgery for cervical cancer. So, and I would like to say on the positive side, I've seen my grandchild 20 years ago. I didn't think I would live to date, but I've lived and I have my grandson, very beautiful. I didn't share the photo next time. I won't go into the details of talking about who a patient is and also about patient safety because 
Nida, Nadim, and uh, the, my predecessors have all talked about patient safety and the need for patients to be at the center of all health care and that families are very, very crucial to ensuring that we have better health outcomes. So I'll come from the field of HIV and at, as we speak now we have HIV prevalence which is of 7.2% among the women which is very high and that we have uh, 15,000 adolescents and young women contracting HIV last year alone and that's a big, big number. And so we also realize that as we age with HIV, as we live longer on antiretroviral treatment, we are facing more and more non-communicable diseases, particularly cancer. And what is coming more, more and killing more women living with HIV is cervical cancer. And so, like I said, I was lucky to have known my, my status early. I was still at stage zero and I had surgery. But of course, when you have cancer, you are not sure about uh, whether the, the, the body will continue to fight against it or it will recur. It's something. We live in the moment. And right now, because of that fear that more women are dying of cervical cancer in Uganda, we have government implementing large-scale screening uh, of women living with HIV in all the implementing um, uh, sites. And um, so what comes to our attention is that after like three months of initiating this large scale program, we had women living with HIV saying we are being forced. We are being forced to test for cervical cancer whether we like it or not. And if you don't do that, you won't get your ARVs. So it was being tagged to treatment and we were just not happy about it. We did ask government as advocates that this stops. Uh, we know the government seems to think they are doing us a service, which they could be doing. But we also believe that if you're going to implement such a program that involves the privacy of an individual, they need to know to consent and accept. We, we know we are, we are having a lot of HIV, uh, cancer positives, but it doesn't help to force people to know that they are positive when they are not even ready to take the test. And I think this we learned from the previous sessions of or, or, the previous HIV at the start when people were being forced and they would run away, they wouldn't even get the results. But in this case, they are forced to test and the results are same day or maybe two or five or so days later. We work in a paternalistic uh, kind of uh, service delivery process. We are still so African and so macho, so authoritative. Is it authoritative? You know, you are, you are the king. No one asks. You just come to the center and they ask, you are Flavia, are you still in the same place you live? You are, you, what, are you still taking the same medicine? You don't have the right to ask a question in many of the centers. Of course, we are improving this, but we are still working in a paternalistic status in the health centers. And therefore, most of the women had nothing to do. And so for those who were, who say they were in their periods, they were taken to side rooms and asked to remove their pads. So dehumanizing, so unethical. And for us, it was going beyond the service we were being provided. And so we talked to the government. The Ministry of Health was willingly listening. They wrote circulars to centers to stop um, this kind of uh, violence. So the, one, the forms of violence that we have raised before that I will just uh, summarize. Information, there was no community mobilization information that this was going to happen. Of course, we had been talking about the prevalence of non-communicable diseases. We wanted the service. But when the service came, we did not have large scale sensitization and mobilization of the communities and we know better how to talk to our people how to inform them of where services are and also inform them on if testing positive where is the nearest we can get the treatment or how we can support those who are on treatment there was no consent for most people in fact there was no signing they claimed that people were consenting verbally but from the coercion 
um, uh, information we got, people were not consenting. They were being forced to say yes. And uh, the beauty is that even on their, in their registers, there was nowhere people were signing. So we asked the government, supposing a patient wants to sue, how would you protect the health provider? So we were on two sides. We are thinking, we are not consenting. People are saying they've been forced, but also you are not protecting the health worker. So it's violence of two, of two sides, both for the provider and the, and the patient. And we are being used as bait at and provide treatment for screening. And we are saying we want integration, but if integration is going to pity one service against the other, we think it is not right. And so if somebody didn't consent, we would expect that they would be given information, go, come back. But the excuse was we are getting mouth month refuse, so it would take long for people to come. And we know that uh, large-scale programs like those of the U.S., those of you who know CDC, PEPFA, they have numbers. So the health workers are on their tentacles to meet the targets. So targets we are driving the screening. So by this end of month, we want to or 40 in this, in this unit. And so they had no choice also to transfer the pressure onto the patients. But we also have a history of, of coercion. In the, in, 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 19, in the 90s, we had coerced uh, cervical, uh, uh, forced sterilization for women living with HIV. So we thought it's just a bait. It's, it's the usual. These are people with HIV. They are a weak gender. They are already sick. You know, we, sh we, we shouldn't even sympathize. They will accept because you are doing them a favor. It's just, you know, if they don't want, they will go and die. But we think in the year 2023, it is now supposed to be mutual understanding, communication, information, and that people should consent to most of these services. We are lucky in our country, we are so timid, we don't go to court, but this would have earned us a lot of, 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 of fines and damages uh, uh, in lieu of the... the Violating our bodily autonomy and privacy is something that is in continuously being seen. People don't say, or people, women rarely talk about it, but this kind of asking, remove the pad, and we see if actually you are bleeding. If you are pregnant, we have to do, if you say you are pregnant, they have to do a pregnancy test. You know, the, the, the trust between the health provider and the, and, the, and the patient is still not in balance. And we know when that happens, it means that the next time I come to the health center, I will not trust the health worker because she's been forcing me. It's not about talking about it and accepting that this is what I need now and that I should do it willingly and accept the consequences and the results and the results willingly. It means that I have to follow whatever the health provider. Do we even took an effort to ask the husbands of some of these women? They said it's okay, the health worker can force the patient, whatever, to do anything, we don't mind. So you can see the, the paternalistic kind of thinking that we have. Even our husbands, we are saying, yeah, it's okay. These women sometimes are, are, are stubborn, so they need to be checked by force. But this is not what should be happening in our, in our um, health centers. Uh, so what do we recommend? Um, we believe that it is important that we have adequate information and education so that we have enough preparedness from the patients, but also the families. Because cancer is not something you just accept in a day and manage. Because you have had those who are being tested immediately, they are stage three, stage four, and the services are very far. So we need to prepare the families with information before they are even uh, screened and given the results. We need also to continually empower the women living with HIV and broadly the women for to do continuous cervical cancer screening so that we are, did we call it pre preemptive? So that people are able to are seen early and treated in time so that we don't have any more dying due to cancer. We want to be involved, we want to see um, the, the health management committees engaging us on those committees. We have community advisory boards, some do have but we also have the, gen the daily uh, health facilities which provide services on a daily. We need to be represented. In some we have, and I think we are part of the 13%, 
13 percent or maybe we are 40 percent in Uganda because we've been raising this uh, for a while since this is just a, an average but we need to continually get representation so that we have information from the communities going directly to the to the leadership and also ensuring that services are improved for better health outcomes but fundamentally is the issue around bodily autonomy and privacy and you know that we are in Uganda, we have the Anti-Homosexuality Act happening, so it is even more uh, complicated. When heterosexual, it's, you can easily discuss the issues of bodily autonomy and, um, and privacy, but as we speak now, that law is going to, to provide means and grounds for arresting and punishing people who are of different sexual orientation. Uh, we also would like to see more um, self tests self self care innovate innovations in light of cervical cancer screening because we know it is possible for somebody to get the sample themselves and provide it to the health provider i know people uh, the, the farmers the governments who say it's so expensive but it empowers the patient to come for services earlier because I, for one, for 20 years, I didn't do cervical cancer screening because each time I would go, I would find a young woman or a young man to do the screening. And I would just turn because I would love to find a woman as old as I am. And for me, after labor ward, 24 years, 20 years ago, before I tested cervical cancer positive, I, had, I did not see a reason to open up for anybody except a person who was maybe my age, who would be my gender. So there are those kinds of, you know, reasons why the cervical cancer should be screening should be consented to and that we should have adequate information so self-care innovations and testing is important in this time and age when we see the innovators are already uh, already doing it so we need to see increased financing for patients rights we have the patients charter but it's on our shelves you know, I know the health providers have the ethics, the, the ethical code of conduct, but we also have the patient's charter, which once it was developed in 2019 itself. And then, of course, we need to collaborate more and engage more with our uh, development partners, with the policy makers, with the health providers to show what is best for us and what works for us and what, what will improve the health outcomes because we all get to benefit from better health of populations and also from quick uh, action and early, early, early um, services. And then, of course, we love integration, but we'd like integration that does not abuse the other, uh, the other service because we start thinking that integration is not right. Because if one is being pitted against the other, it wouldn't uh, do much work. So violence, finally, now this is to the, to the Switzerland government. I've, I, I got a visa. I got it from Nairobi. I had to travel back and forth. But I was given four days to come to Geneva. So it's like they think we really want to be here and stay forever. I'm 15 years sick. I was just asking myself, my visa is a tourist visa, right? So in four days, if I came for a conference and I wanted to visit um, Basel, those things there the things I see. how would I so is this um, a way to welcome us patients or is it because we are patients that we are given for three days to come because I think when you visit you visit at least two weeks so that I'm able to see the environment and also so violence is not in terms of us going to the health facilities but the global policy framework is also prohibitive I have failed to attend before because it's, it's difficult to get visas, it's difficult to travel over long distances. But I imagine that Switzerland, which is the hub of the world, should actually know better that when we visit, we don't visit like we are running away, we must be chased, but that when we come, we are coming to a place where it is peaceful, where we can stay three more days and watch the beautiful scenery. So I, I, I would implore, supposing next week there is a conference and I want to come back. I still have to pay 80 euro, travel to Nairobi, get a visa. That is about maybe uh, $200 uh, to be able to get another visa to come if I was to return next week. So I implore that whoever can reach the embassy, tell them that this hurts us, the patients, because we need to be part of all 
conferences because we are the reason some of these institutions are based in Geneva. The WHO is for patients, right? If there was no patient, there wouldn't be a health organization. You know, so why would we be treated like aliens in a global, in a global country where we are coming not to stay, but to share our experience and inform the world on better health outcomes? I rest my case. Thank you. Uh, th thank you very much, Flavia. Very, very passionately spoken, and I think we will raise this issue that Switzerland isn't what it used to be. I think we all experienced that. Our own vice chair was denied entrance because he's a patient, but he's, the insurance cover had one wording, small wording that could have changed the difference between Schengen and Switzerland. It's another matter. Okay, um, I think the time for questions is very little. We can't ask those questions, unfortunately. We have to um, all abandon this uh, room for the, the management to take over. But we will look at online questions. If you have questions, please write to us. I will forward them to the various uh, participants and give you answers in writing and continue this debate. I think this is the reason why we had set this debate was that Global Patient Safety Action Plan is for another seven years. So save your questions. The questions will keep on repeating. And again, Neelam is going to invite some of us uh, here again. <laughs> Flavia, you, 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 you have spoken a true word and uh, you'll be traveling again, I think, uh, from what we, we want storytellers like you coming here and discussing it. Uh, so I'll now thank the panel again. Starting with Neelam. Neelam, thank you very much for the over 10 years of hard work getting that agenda in there. And now you leave a very safe health system for us. I think it's now up to us to do it. Neelam's done the drawing and drafting. Let's build it up. She's the architect. We are the builders of it. Let's use patient endeavor. I'd like to thank Neda for continuing that, uh, taking on the troll and the cement to start building it up. Uh, I would love to thank again from the healthcare in danger uh, that you're always there on top of the hill welcoming us. And please do open up those offices to other. And thank you very much uh, for, for being here. Today, it's, it's been a great pleasure uh, working with you. And uh, uh, lastly, I think I'll thank uh, Flavia and uh, take it from there. And not forgetting, Louis, I think, please do get ready for the European, uh, so the Emergency Medicine Day on the 26th. Please participate in that. I think the learnings that you will have from that will be translated into yours. Uh, we talk of the golden hour that whereby within that hour, if you get a patient in, you get the best results of that. Let's talk about the emergency and support to Lewis and the emergency medicine. And thank you very much, everybody. Uh, safe travels. Enjoy the rest of the evening. Uh, we're here around for a couple of hours. And let's meet up again during the week. Uh, uh, if anybody's coming for um, Walk the Talk, remember at 8.30 to meet all the delegates. They'll be with a broken chair, is, you know, that three-legged chair. At 8.30 on Sunday morning, everybody's coming there. Uh, let's walk and talk further. Thank you. <laughs>